Hey, you ever been to Disney World? I have. I have, I want to say two times in Disneyland oh. once. Oh. No, Disneyland twice. Yeah. Oh, dang. Okay. Yeah, you're the expert here, which is no. probably going to work better. Yeah, we just went with the family here uh, a couple weeks back, and dude, that was a lot. It's just, yeah, yeah I, it's a lot. It, it's an avalanche of things to think about and navigate, and it's an avalanche of meanings. Our last episode we did, we were, really, we were talking again about how stuff means stuff. What you take pictures on means something. What you read on means something. Everything means something. There is so much meaning is like my meaningometer was just overloaded, is pegged the whole time. And I've kind of wanted to process it with you. What do you mean? Just like the rides or I don't know what well, you mean by stuff means stuff. What do you mean? Okay. Well, you got four parks at Disney World, right? You got Animal Kingdom, which I think is the newest. You've got the Hollywood Studios, which is from the late 80s. You've got Epcot Center, which was the vision of the future when I was a kid. I remember learning about Epcot Center in a weekly reader. And then you've got the classic, which is Magic Kingdom. You know, that's your Mickey Mouse and beloved Disney characters and Cinderella's Castle. I think it's Cinderella's Castle and all of that. No, it's Sleeping Beauty's Castle at Disney World. Cinderella's at Disneyland, right? I don't know. I have no I don't idea. Know either. I'm not an expert in this stuff. And so you, you go through and in all of these parks... They're taking all these different things, all these different movies and stories and myths, some of which they created, some of which are references all the way back to very old fairy tales, and they're mushing it into one park. And so you go from one ride or one bit of architecture to the next, and it's like this new thing conjures this whole new set of meanings and values and ideas from this moment in time or this cultural moment over here. And then you go around the next corner and yeah, there's Toy Story 2. You're like, oh, okay. Uh, you got a friend in me. That means a whole bunch of things. And you go around another corner. It's like, uh, there's a Millennium Falcon. Oh, uh, that's <laughs> force. And now I'm in this world. And, and I don't uh, think now... I've been since they've gone full on Star Wars. Like I, I okay. do... Way back in the day, they had a ride that was all Star Wars, and it was like one of those uh, six degree of not six degrees, but but basically you get inside this projector type thing, and it shakes you around like you're on a spaceship or something. But this was like they're full on Star Wars now, right? Yeah, they they built this whole Star Wars land. You're watching the Clone Wars cartoons right now, right? Yeah, absolutely. We are. We're about halfway through, maybe. But dude, okay. they're great. Dude, they're amazing. What do you like about Clone Wars? The writing is just great. It's really, really good. You've got recurring characters, and they have certain things about them that they're good at and they're bad at. And I don't know. They're just well-written, and they're complex. Complex political issues, complex planet issues. I just really like them. I had no idea that the animated series might be one of my favorites. It's incredible. Until The Mandalorian, I think it was the best thing in Star Wars, and maybe it still is the best thing in Star Wars, but it's the same guy. Dave Filoni did both. He came up with Ahsoka Tano and all of those plot lines and really wrung a lot more value out of the rather slipshod prequel era material. Absolutely. So yeah, I, I've liked it too. The crown jewel of Hollywood Studios is this Rise of the Resistance ride. Has anybody told you about this? No, not at all. Okay. I am choosing to proceed on the following assumption, my friend, that I can't spoil a ride. Is that a fair assumption? Okay. Or do yep, I, I let's mean, do it. can you spoil a ride? You kind of can, but I am asking you to spoil the ride. Go for it. Okay, let's do it. So Rise of the Resistance is set between episode six and like right before episode seven. And it's fun. This is neat. It's the most thoughtful line that they put together. The artifacts and the details are really cool. It just feels like you're in Star Wars. Right now, at least, you have to get a boarding time, so there is no line. You have to log in real, real quick at like 7.30 a.m. exactly and hit refresh and refresh and refresh on your app. And if you're lucky, they assign you a time and you get to go on the ride you paid for. And if you're not lucky, sorry, you don't get to go on the coolest ride that you paid for. So it's, really? it's kind of a crap system, <laughs> but it was nice to not wait in a long line. So you just show up at the appointed time. You cruise right through everything. You take a glance at all the line and stuff. But what's cool about this ride is you don't know where the line ends and the ride begins. What do you mean? Like, it's just like a slow transition into the ride? Yeah. 
you go from being outside to being inside to seeing a lot of Star Wars props that are really neat to getting toward the front. And now you're seeing like Star Wars vehicles and there are more attendants along the way as you get further in line and they're all acting. They're all playing a role to move you along in the line and move you through the story that they're trying to craft. And this is the only story ride where I felt like the story kind of worked. So they get you into this little, you know, let's load up and get ready troopers kind of thing. And they get you set to go and then they open the door and you walk out and boom, there's Poe Dameron's iconic black and gold X-Wing. It's really cool. Full size replica. I mean, there it is. (laughs) It's really neat to get to look at that. And then you turn around And there's this shuttle sitting over there under a bunch of rocks and everything. And they give you this little briefing and they're like, all right, we're going to try and do this thing or that thing or something. Get on this shuttle. Let's go. And everybody loads up in the shuttle. And then you got somebody that looks like Admiral Akbar in there. That's like a, you know, animatronic kind of thing. There's a bunch of screens and communication going on. Wait, wait a second. So is this like an actual shuttle? It's like a thing you can go get into, like getting into the van with the A-team? Is there a place where you can get into the van with the A-Team? I just made that up. But can, I want to go on saying? that ride. <laughs> you know uh, I think saying? we just found a way to get rich. No. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, it's like that. It's just, I mean, it's just a rebel-looking shuttle. Okay. So it's pretty cool. I mean, the doors and everything operate the way you would hope. And you get on there, and it kind of shakes and jimmies around, and there's a whole story, and... Uh, it's not Admiral Akbar, but it's somebody who looks like him. He's like, oh, we're caught in a tractor beam. And you get sucked into this Imperial cruiser kind of thing. And it gets really cool at that point. So all the monitors are telling you like, oh, you're on this cruiser now. And then they open the opposite bay door and you all have to walk out. It's breathtaking. You walk into one of those giant Imperial look out into space Star Wars hangar type rooms and all of the Disney people they're all in there dressed as imperial officers with the gray and the nifty little imperial navy hats and all of that and the visors and the masks and all of that business too because just know, say just it they're dressed travel. like Nazis just say uh, it they're dressed okay like let's Nazis. just say it they're dressed like space Nazis <laughs> and then they treat you like space Nazis they're like yelling at you and crap And so you go in and, you know, there's my little guy and he's with me and I got my hands on his shoulders and he's kind of taken in the room. And they're like, you rebel scum. I'm like, oh, okay, easy now. He's a very nice boy. I think scum is a little much. Do you think they're actors? Like, do you think they went to school for theater? If they did, nobody acted like this was a disappointment or not the job they wanted. They seemed really happy to be there and really happy to play the roles. And they did a very good job. That's the thing about Disney World, man. Like, every single employee at Disney World is all in. Even the janitor that's literally sweeping the street is whistling Disney music. I don't know how they do that. I you, like, I don't know either. I mean, they must pay them pretty well. They must. There was a street sweep when I was there. He had water, and he was, like, wetting the concrete, and he would be sweeping and whistling, and you're like, oh, that's a nice man. Just And all of a sudden, he would take the water, and he would draw like an amazing character. He would draw Mickey Mouse, and it would look just like Mickey Mouse, but he would draw it in water on the concrete. Yeah. So it's like the little bitty details like that that Disney just gets right. They just nail it. I I don't know how they do that, but they nail it. Well, we went down Splash Mountain, the one that has like Br'er Rabbit and all those other characters nobody's ever heard of anymore. I love it. Yeah, that's one of my favorite rides. Okay. So we went down that, and the kiddo... The little guy got a bloody nose coming right off of that. And it Uh had nothing to do with the ride. The ride was fine. He just got a bloody nose. I don't know. So we walk out of there and he's just a sweet yellow haired little boy who's delighted, but also he's gushing blood out of his nose. So we hustle off of there and we kind of just run over to a place where we can sit. And I tell you what, man, he was not bleeding for more than 15 seconds and we had immediate attention from Disney. Now, obviously, it's not good for business to have people bleeding all over stuff. But it was very attentive help, and I was impressed in that moment. Like, what did they do? Well, there was a guy who was literally whistling whistle while you work, dressed up as a dwarf, and he came over with a paintbrush and started painting like Mickey Mouse with my kid's blood just on the concrete right there. Shut and up. I was like, <laughs> what, did, what did they actually do? <laughs> no, he just came over. He's like, hey, I'm, I'm sorry. What can I do to help? What does he need? The guy just broke character and was compassionate and nice to my kid. And made my kid and my wife feel not self-conscious about a awkward thing, like a nosebleed. They're just nice and seemed like they meant it. Go ahead. Keep going. 
Oh, so anyways, uh, you're in this room. I mean, there are like 50 stormtroopers in formation standing in front of this giant bay that leads out into space. And the officers are in there barking at you. And there's some little droids scooting around. And you're like, dang, I feel like I'm in trouble. I feel like my family is in trouble. I should do something. But I don't think I'm supposed to. Literally 50? I don't know. Yeah, like like a whole detachment of stormtroopers all there at attention with their rifles in their hands just looking at you Whoa. as you get off. Uh, yeah, I, I assume they're animatronic or just sculptures. They didn't really do anything. I don't think they were actors, but it was still really intimidating and pretty neat looking. So you actually feel a little bit of pressure and you move into the next place and you get interrogated a little bit by the employees. And they're like, no, into the brig. And then they send you into this room and then... Kylo Ren walks on this rail up above you and I don't know, maybe Punk. General Hux or Admiral Hux is there too. And they menace at you a little bit and oh, you will give me the plans, blah, blah, whatever. And like, oh, okay. And then they just lock you in a room and you're in there for a minute. And you kind of, well, this is an interesting ride. We're just in prison. And then the wall <laughs> next to you, I mean, that'd be the most amazing way to, uh, to arrest people. Like, oh, we're going on a ride. In the country. Surprise, you're in prison. Dang it. I can't believe I fell for that. And so you're, you're in the prison with the kids. And we're all just kind of standing around. And then the wall lights up and it looks like somebody's cutting through it with a lightsaber or something. And surprise, awesome. it's the That's rebellion. like the best thing you can do with a lightsaber is cut <laughs> through like solid steel. It's amazing. Yes, or hands. Those two things. I like seeing the hands come off too in every episode. <laughs> they take us out and they're like, all right, we're getting you out of here. And we hijacked these Imperial droids and they're going to drive you on this prisoner transport cart to get you out of here. Then you get in this cart and you buckle in and then it, it takes you through this whole story. You go past the bridge and Hux and Kylo Ren are like, hey, what the heck? What are those prisoners doing here? That's not right. And then it's on and stormtroopers come out and they shoot at you and the way the bolts are coming right at you and everything and there's explosions and it's doing damage to the environment around you. And the carts are all independently controlled. So you see some other groups, but you're not in order. It was weird, man, to me, when I knew it was pretty quality and immersive. When the stormtroopers started shooting at my family, I really felt like I needed to do something. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> they're stormtroopers. They can't hit anything. That's a good but point. You, <laughs> like, you, you literally thought you needed to defend your family? It felt so weird to be in this cart, all buckled in, and all of these soldiers come out and start shooting at you, and you don't get to do anything. Like, the robot's like, stay down. What? No. I need to go punch someone. They're shooting bullets at my family, right? Stay down. I'm not trusting you. You're a robot. It was very immersive, and you did feel like you were under duress and under pressure, and I mean, obviously, you know where you are, but it's just kind of this impulse feeling. And so then it, it wheels you around and you run away from the baddies and you see a bad animatronic of uh, Finn yelling some orders at you or whatever. And then they strap you into a thing and it free falls down onto the planet surface and then you're done. And we all came off of that ride and we were like, that was pretty cool. I didn't like the sequel movies. I didn't don't feel any connection to any of those characters at all. But the ride was genius, just the amount of thought that went into making that thing. Okay, so question. Yes? What was your favorite thing that you did? I think my favorite thing was looking at what they built. I think my favorite thing would have to be, in terms of rides, it would be the Avatar Flight of the Rite of Passage, Flight of the Passage, whatever it's called. Wait a second. When you say when you say Avatar, are you talking like the planet Pandora with the blue hair? Yeah, yeah. Interactions, the, the cosplayers. <laughs> yeah. Have you been to Disney World since they added the whole Pandora World thing? No, oh. I didn't even know that was uh, Disney owns that. I guess so. It's there, and it's in Animal Planet, which is kind of goofy because it feels, I mean, pretty sci-fi-ish, but it's so neat the way they integrate it. So Pandora sits right next to the centerpiece of the park, which is the gigantic tree of life, which is just beautiful, beautifully thought through, artfully done. It has a little bit of that Captain Planet Earth Day era feel. It transcends that well enough that it's it's pretty neat. So you got that and then you got the whole Africa area, 
which felt very much like the places on that continent I've been. It, it was pretty neat. And then you just kind of go downhill across this bridge and the plants start to look a little more alien and then a lot more alien. And you can't really tell what's a real plant and what's a fake alien plant anymore. And then you come around the corner and do you remember those mountains that defy gravity and float all broken up way up in the sky in Avatar? Yeah, totally. They built that. I sat there and stared at it and tried to figure out the engineering behind it and how you would make that safe. But somehow they did it. It's upside down mountains that float above you. You can walk under them and waterfalls are coming off of them. I mean, it is neat. That's crazy. That's where everybody wants to be. I mean, I think it's the neatest thing in all of the Disney stuff. But the ride there, again, I, I can't think of the exact name, but it's like the Flight of Passage or something like that. Do you remember the scene in Avatar where Jake Sully has to capture one of those pterodactyl looking birds and ride it around? Not at all. Not even a little bit. So that movie made a pretty big impression on you. <laughs> I just remember thinking, wow, this was, I mean, the 3D element was cool, but no, I just remember leaving feeling like I'd been sat down and lectured about how bad I was for a long time because I hated the environment. Thank you for saying that. Yeah, you know, I, I remember thinking this was a really cool movie, but there was so much agenda-driven stuff in that movie. I remember thinking, okay, got it. I'm the bad guy. <laughs> yes, <laughs> so. it was like if Dances with Wolves took guilt steroids and then reshot the whole thing in space. And I like Dances with Wolves. <laughs> and I feel like Dances with Wolves had at least a little bit of touch <laughs> to it. <laughs> oh, but oh, golly. Dude. That's pretty good, man. Avatar is a three-hour lecture. It's nuts. And I'm not saying that some of the lecture maybe isn't even merited. It's just not why I watch a movie. And the sooner we're done with that, the better storytelling will be. And the plot of Avatar suffered because the agenda was the point. So you have these ridiculously overwrought, snidely whiplash characters who aren't interesting or complex. They're bad. And they just want to They're just after the unobtainium. And yeah. it's called unobtainium, by the way. Yeah. Yeah, I, I like golf. Yeah, Giovanna Ravisi, I, I just like the golf. I like hitting the golf ball in the cup. Oh, don't mess with my golf ball in the cup. See, I'm a jerk. I have a tie. So I'm a jerk. That's how you know. And then the other guy's like, I, when everything has a hammer, everything's a nail, and I am the hammer, and I'm going to hammer everything. And all we can do, to, we just got to kill all the things. Like, <sighs> I don't know. Yeah, when the bad guys are that flat and lame, the movie doesn't work. When the bad guy is Thanos-level interesting, and there's some part of you that's like, dang, does he have a point? I don't want him to have a point. I actually have to think about what he's saying. I feel some empathy with him. That's a good bad guy, and that's when you know you got a great movie on your hands. So I'm with you. Avatar didn't super move the needle for me, but it was neat. Like It was neat to be in that world for a couple hours, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. If you can make me feel like I'm somewhere else, almost like escapism, that's pretty cool. And I think that's the power of Disney World or Disneyland in general. You feel like you're somewhere else. I think that's what you ultimately paid for. Yeah. Um, I want to follow up on that question just so I don't get lost here. Let me tell you about the coolest thing there. And I, I want to come back to that, the escapism element. Is that all right okay. if I finish telling you about the Pandora ride? Yeah, do it. Okay. You wait in this long line. The line is beautiful. It takes you inside Pandora and then you kind of get into this compound, which is fun. And then eventually you get to the end and they start explaining what's going to happen. And you realize this is the perfect scenario for making a ride because it is what it is. I mean, in Avatar, you link yourself through a machine to a different consciousness, a different or the same consciousness, but a different body, a different physical experience. And it's like you're really experiencing this other world. Well, that's what they tried to recreate. So they take you into the link chamber and you get on this little almost motorcycle-like device. You're staring straight ahead at a, a chunk of plastic. I mean, nothing could possibly happen with the plastic. It's not electronic. You're like, I don't know how this ride is going to work. There's nothing that can happen here. So you sit on the thing and it's giving you all of this stuff about, oh, we're working on the link, 36% complete, 72% complete. And it locks you into place with these restraints on your legs and your back. So you're holding onto the grips of this motorcycle-like thing. You're wearing some kind of visor goggles that I've never seen before. It was a different rig. And 
it's like, okay, we got you linked up. You're about to connect with your avatar and you're going to have to go get one of these pterodactyl birds. These, they call them banshees. And then you're going to, you're going to fly it around. And if you can survive the flight, you've passed this rite of Navi passage. So you're like, I, okay, cool. But I just can't picture what the ride is going to be because I'm looking at some cheap plastic sheeting right in front of me. Well, then it counts down. It's like, all right, link commencing. And then it hits you with these strobe lights that felt like they were in the visor. So you just can't see anything for a second. Nothing. Like your world goes away for just about two seconds. And in that time, clearly they must slide away that plastic sheet that's in front of you that you're looking at. And all of a sudden you're in the middle of the biggest IMAX screen you'll ever see. And it's curved. So you're in the middle of the lens. And you kind of picture that like a, a contact lens. I'm confused. Are you still wearing the visor? You're just talking about you're in a 360 degree space is what you're saying. It feels like it. It feels like you're in a half circle, but you know, peripheral vision only goes so far. So yes, you still have the visor on, but it's like you got hit with these strobe lights for two seconds and now you're in a completely different world. Okay. The way they get you into the ride was incredible. And the second the strobe lights are done and you squint and blink and you're like, whoa, where the heck am I? You get hit with this smell of the forest and this humidity yeah. gets injected into the room. And so you immediately feel like you're somewhere else. The visual is so immersive and you're so close to it that you feel like you're somewhere else. And then you realize, oh, I'm on the back of one of these banshees. I can kind of see it here. And you're up on top of those crazy floating mountains. And you're like, oh, maybe I don't want to jump off of this. And it walks right up to the edge, spreads its wings, and just dumps over the edge of this mountain, just screaming down at the ground. It's incredible. <laughs> it's just incredible. And you wend and wind through all these trees and over water, and you see creatures and Navi all over the place. And you go through kind of a surfing tube for a second. You get blasted with water as you do that. And I was just grinning the whole time. This is incredible. Incredibly imaginative. The story behind it, the execution, all the little details are there. I think it's one of the neatest, not just rides, but I think it's one of the neatest things I've ever seen anywhere ever. Surely that is top five entertainment moments of my whole life. I, I've never seen anything like it. I cannot wait for you to try it out and to hear what you thought. Are you serious? I'm serious. It was incredible. And I gladly waited another 90 minutes two more times to do it two more times, even knowing what was coming. Really? So you rode this thing three times? Yep. Took me a whole day <laughs> to ride it three times. But it's all I wanted to do. And then you get done riding that ride and you're like, I don't want to go on a jungle boat cruise with Pocahontas. <laughs> that doesn't sound interesting at all. <laughs> I don't want to go do a sing-along with frogs that have banjos. I want to ride the freaking pterodactyl again. Yeah, you just you can't wait to get back. It, it was so neat, man. So neat. And everybody in the third chair who's been on it, uh, I bet there's not one of them who's like, man, I don't know. It's pretty overrated. I bet they would all tell you the same thing. That's awesome. That's awesome. No, I, I have not done that. But I do like it when you find your ride, like the one that connects with you in like a crazy way. Yeah, what's yours? Oh, I don't know. At Six Flags, there was this this slingshot roller coaster. I forget what it was called. It was like the Double Vortex or something like that. Sure. Sounds like a vacuum. Yeah, I just remember stuff like that. But like at Disney, I don't know what my ride is, but I do enjoy finding a ride and that's like, oh, that's the one I want to do. Yep, that's my ride. That's the one. I would go back just to do that again. You know what I would do? is I would take a friend to see them do it for the first time. Because you can't experience that again yourself for the first time. But when you experience great wonder, you always have the opportunity to relive that moment of first experiencing it vicariously through people you care about getting to enjoy it for the first time. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I don't know about Disney with friends, though. Disney with Brady was cool. It was just two people, and we just went. But like when you take a family, it's kind of a thing. Because you have to figure out, what does this person want to do? This person's got to pee. This person's hungry. The way to do Disney is combat mode. <laughs> like, we're going <gonna, laughs> we're, we're gonna to travel light. We're going to travel fast. Yeah. You know? yeah. I need everybody to be on their A game. You need a water, and you need a granola bar, and we're going to hit it all up. Lock and load, baby. <laughs> you know, that's how you do Disney. Did you take your family? I have in the past, yeah. 
It's been a long time. Did your brain sit there and run money calculations? Like, all right, every nope. minute that we nope. stand here staring at this wall makes less value for what we paid for this. We're never doing this thing again, so let's go. Like, let's get in more awesome. You can't do that. You have to just, getting back to the escapism thing, that's what you're paying for. So you have to completely immerse yourself and you just have to pretend like you're not paying way too much money for what you're getting. The beauty of Disney, though, is kids. Yeah. So the two ways to do Disney are combat mode, just you and another person running fast, or another way is just like to completely embrace the inner child, you know, preferably with your child. And we want to take my daughter, who turned six last week, we want to take her before the magic leaves. And you know what I mean by magic, right? Well, that's why we went when we did. Felt like we couldn't wait any longer. We needed to get it now so that the magic would still happen. Yeah. And that's the, the childlike wonder, right? Yeah, exactly that. Yeah, we want to do that as well. I can picture your kiddo having an extra bonus degree of magic and wonder from normal kiddos. She does. I feel like that place was built for her. I agree. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you better get it in now. Right now is right. I know, but the COVID thing. Yeah. Like, I don't know. I felt like it was worth battling through that. You get to move in pretty hard. I mean, it's kind of athletic, like you just said. I mean, it's combat mode, right? Yeah. You get to move in pretty hard and you got those masks on. It can be a little more tiring than it would be otherwise. But for us, the math equation was, if we wait a year, where are our kids going to be? Will they be too cool for this? Their brains are all right for it right now. We need to do this right now. And so we did. And, you know, whenever you go, whatever's going on in life, you're going to have stuff that is a good reason not to. And we ultimately decided that age of kids and sense of wonder was the determining factor. Yeah, I think you did the right thing. Hey, this episode of No Dumb Questions is brought to you by you. You being the people who have jumped in on the No Dumb Questions email list. Destin, how does the email list work? Yeah, I set one up. Uh, the beautiful thing about podcasts is they have an RSS feed, a really simple syndication feed. And No, 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 no. That's not what RSS means. Is it really? I think so. Really simple syndication, yeah. yeah I've heard you say that. I thought you were joking. No, I think, I think it is. Oh. Look up RSS feed right now. Look it up. Mm -hmm. RSS, RSS feed. feed. Mm -hmm. Okay, just uh, what does RSS stand for? You've got to be kidding me. <laughs> it really just, really simple syndication. Yeah. That's it. That's it. Well, I have overthought so many names of so many things I have tried to invent. <laughs> wow. Okay. Um, I'm humbled. No, uh, RSS, not a really big deal. Syndication. No, that's, okay. the, that's right. the beauty right. of podcasts because uh, one thing that's happening today is there's a bunch of algorithms getting in front of everybody. In fact, we've had people approach us here at No Dumb Questions asking us if our podcast could, like, join a network and stuff like that. They're like, hey, we want you to be a whatever. And we're like, yep. uh, why would we do that? <laughs> we, don't uh -huh. want, we don't want anybody in between us and uh, the people that like to listen to us that are as weird as we are. <laughs> so... Uh, yeah, it's like we want to seize on the really simpleness of the really simple syndication setup. Yeah, but sometimes people have told us like, oh, I didn't realize you released a new one because part of the RSS feed thing is that you have to go to your podcast thing and it'll download the latest episode or whatever. So we created an email list. The idea here with the email list is not to try to do something that RSS is already doing. If, if you're a person that uses the Stitcher app or whatever it is you use and, and you religiously check that, awesome. But if you're the kind of person that would like to get an email when we drop a new episode, like instantly, then I'm trying to do that now. And you can do that by going to notumquestions.fm. That's our website, by the way, notumquestions.fm. And uh, just slash email list. I got a little link at the top there on the top navigation bar. So that's it. So very simply, the whole point of this NEN is just to put it there so we can let people know when this stuff is happening and over the long haul, build it out so that we don't have anything between us and the third chair. NEN. I know you want me to ask. What is NEN? Oh, it's a notification email notifier. <laughs> That's too many TLAs, man. I mean, if you can do really simple syndication 
we can have an N-E-N. TLAs are getting out of control, and I want you to ask me what TLA stands for, and it's three-letter acronym. So Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, yeah, that's it. Um, we have an email list, and if you'd like to join, that's cool. Some tricks. If you use Gmail, uh, I think you might find this interesting. You can add filters in Gmail. You may or may not have done that before, but here, here's a trick that I use. Gmail doesn't recognize periods like a dot. So you can be like uh, your first name dot your last name at Gmail. That is the same email address as just first name, last name at Gmail. It, it, Gmail does not see the period. Another thing it doesn't see is anything after the plus sign. So you could do what I do. Uh, like if I sign up, for example, to follow people on Patreon and I want to filter that into all one folder, it's just like my email address plus patron at gmail.com. And so you can set up a really easy filter to filter everything. So you could do that, for example. You could be like your email address plus ndq at gmail.com, and you could filter all the podcasts into one place if you wanted to do that. We have no intention okay. of, of flooding your email address or your email inbox at all because I hate getting too many emails. I try to keep this simple. It's like, hey, new episode, here it is, click, boom. That is really clever. I didn't know that's how that worked. So for me, the TMBH plus NDQ at gmail.com allows me on my side to filter stuff associated with that. Wait, walk yeah. me through this again. Yeah, you can do that. It's also a way to do what uh, I think in espionage world is referred to as the blue dye experiment where, or whatever it's called, the blue dye method where you release information to different people and you tack on certain dye to the information like you would release a story, for example, to 20 people, and you have just a little different information in each story. And then when one leaks to the press, you can figure out who leaked the information for you. So I also use this technique for that. So, for example, I'll do my email address plus name of the company I'm giving my email address to. So like, let's say I gave my email address to Academy Sports, for example. I'd say like Destin's email address plus academy at gmail.com. And then... If I start getting spam and the spam is coming from, you know, I just check the die, as I call it, at the end of the email address, and I can figure out who the rat was that leaked my email address. No way. That's what I do. Oh, that's yeah. clever. Yeah. I do that as a way to uh, trust the integrity of, of businesses that I deal with. So feel free to do that to us. So, um, uh, yeah, indeed. I'm, I'm doing that to us. I'm going to sign up right now to find out if you're abusing your privileges. <laughs> no dumb questions dot fm slash email hyphen list or just no dumb questions dot fm and then just click email list in the top navigation bar. But bottom line is, thank you all for listening to this thing. I mean, what a what a goofy deal to be able to sit with my friend and talk about stuff that we care about and do part of our friendship with microphones on and then get to share that with people all over the world. We were talking about it before we even turned on mics here. This is a privilege. It's a really cool thing. The word and is blessing. It is a blessing. Yes, it is. Yeah. It's a joy. And the idea that you would jump on and voluntarily hop on an email list because you want to stay a part of the conversation is one more of those little indicators of, hey, this thing is cool and humbling and it wouldn't exist if you weren't on the other end of the conversation, third chair. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Do you like those rides that tell a story? Does, I mean, does it work for you when it, when it tries to tell a story or would you rather just like skip me the, the whole stupid story thing and just whip me around a little bit? I love them because I'm goal oriented. So even if we're trying to like whatever Mr. Toad's magic adventure or whatever, mm -hmm. or the Toy Story one where you zap things with a gun, I like an objective and I like that we're trying to accomplish it. And at the very end of the ride, you always do the thing you were trying to do. I can't think of a single ride where you get to the end and you're like, oh, sorry, <laughs> you, you lost. <laughs> I can't think of a ride that does that. There's a payoff moment that you're going for with all of them. Yeah, I would like a failure option on some of these. I mean, not not like a physically painful failure option, but I would welcome that. So you like Pirates of the Caribbean? I do, actually. Hmm. Yeah, I like, I like the animatronics because I like to think how they did all that. I think of the engineering. I'm like, okay, this is a boat, but it's not a boat. It's kind of a boat, you know? And, and I think about how they, like, for example, how do you keep water flowing on a river in a circle? How do you do that? I have thought about that. And I was looking over the side of the boat the whole time, ignoring the shrieking Cabbage Patch kids while I was in Small World trying to figure it out. 
I know. And so it's a pump, and they're pumping the water around. But at some point, it has to actually go downhill. So the water has to flow downhill, or you have to have pump pressure in one direction. So at some point, those rides have to go up in order to go down. And so I think about all that kind of stuff. For me, a ride, yeah, I totally do. Small world, that's weird. It doesn't seem like small world goes down at all. That's my point. And maybe that's why it moves so slow and is a 16-minute ride of the same two sentences worth of a song. I like it. I think it's cute. <laughs> oh, that one I like kills me. all the little bitty things and it's a small world. I think it's really fun because of how hokey it is. Oh, it is that. Like this was peak entertainment. This was the Avatar ride with Catching the Banshee back in the 50s. How about that? Whenever Disney World opened, I don't know. Yeah. And it was very optimistic. Like if you put us all together, things are going to get better. And look at all these very different people with their different traditions and we will honor them all. Yeah, I like what they're going for. You mentioned that you rode the Epcot Center ride, right? The one that tells a story that takes you through the globe at Epcot. You know the one I mean? You're talking about the silver globe in the center of Epcot that looks like some type of geodesic dome. Yes. And it's like the history of the world or something like that. Is, isn't that the theme? Yes. Yeah. I love Epcot. And it's it's not so much about the rides and stuff like that, but I, if I recall correctly, that's where like the Finding Nemo stuff is. So you get all the science in Epcot. Like I remember learning about... What's it called? Hydra, the way you grow a Hail garden Hydra? without soil. Hydro, oh, hydroponics. Hydroponic? Hydroponics, yeah. I learned about all that stuff in Epcot because they take you to this world of tomorrow kind of thing. Yeah. Love it. I absolutely love it. But what is the globe, though? What's it? What's the ride called? I don't know what the ride is. It's like a history of communication or something. But it starts with the Stone Age and it takes you up through classical times and the Middle Ages and the printing press. And all of that kind of business. And I thought that was interesting. I don't want my next comment to come off like, if you don't put up things about my God, I don't like your park. Because it's not like that. I mean, when I was a kid, there was all kinds of like, like Christianity was just kind of everywhere. It was part of the culture. And at this point, uh, most art just doesn't acknowledge the existence of religion. I mean, when they had that moment in Shazam where they prayed before a meal, even though it was a very nebulous prayer, it was still like so jarring for me. I just hadn't seen anything like that in forever. There's sort of this assumption of not faith. And maybe that's just the best way to market to everybody and be fair to everybody and make it fun to everybody. So I don't want the next comment to make it sound like I got a beef with Disney because they don't have enough stuff about my God in Disney. That's not where I'm at. That said, going through Epcot, which was the final park that we visited, There's one moment where Michelangelo is painting the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, and he's painting the part where, you know, the most famous image in the Sistine Chapel, of course, is the creation of man. And you've got Adam and God just out of reach of each other. It's like what the E.T. thing was evoking, where the fingers of Elliot and E.T. almost touch. It's that moment. You don't see humanity in the painting. You don't see Adam you see Michelangelo reaching out to God with his paintbrush. And I thought, and that's a pretty sophisticated thing they did there. You know, I read it as them saying that God is a a creation of man and that God looks a lot like man and that man is maybe crafting notions of God in his and her own image. So I didn't take it as like, oh, wow, that's so faith affirming. And I feel really encouraged and blessed by this. I just appreciated it as an interesting moment where there's an acknowledgement of this part of what humanity is. I mean, the vast majority of humans for all of time have believed that there is some reason to all of this, that there's some kind of deity. And it was interesting to see that aspect of humanity acknowledged. But we went from there to, uh, I, I saw in my little app, I was like, oh, they've got a stave church, like a Norwegian old school Viking looking church. And we have one of those in Rapid City in the Black Hills. And I thought, oh, this is really cool. I wonder what they're going to do with it. Like the Catholic version, the Lutheran version, what are they going to do? And ultimately, it was entirely dedicated to Freya and Thor and Loki and Odin. So it was, they went- In a stave church? Yeah, it was a stave church that had no reference to Christianity, which I kind of thought was odd. And I think you'd kind of at least acknowledge that cultural element, but they didn't. I don't know. Maybe I am a little bit put off by that. 
Is that unfair of me to be put off by that? Well, it's just not accurate. Yeah, that's how I feel. Yeah, I'm not a Catholic or a Lutheran. That's, that's different than what I think. It just, I don't know, it seemed incomplete. So where is this at? This is in the ball in Epcot? No, 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 no. So I walked out of the ball, did that ride, thought it was really interesting. Um, I really liked the way that ride in the ball in the middle of Epcot gives you something to think about, about life in the future and what will things look like and what's your contribution to this story. I, was, I thought it was cool. Definitely coming from a, a strongly Deweyite humanist perspective, but uh, there's truth and value in that stuff. So I, I appreciated the perspective. I enjoyed the ride. We walked out of there and we went straight toward the big lake where you've got all the different cultures represented. And so we went left to right. We went, um, yeah, we went to our left, which means Mexico is the first place, kind of like Casa Bonita in Denver. That place was neat. But you know what? Actually, I, I maybe have an objection there too. In presenting Mexican culture, they highlighted Dia de los Muertos really heavily, which, I mean, that's cool. That's fascinating. It's a very important, interesting, unique part of Mexican culture. But I don't know if you've heard this or not, but it turns out Catholicism is actually also really popular in Mexico. Some might even argue that it's yeah. pretty formative to what goes on there culturally. And in South America in general. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Weird how that is. And all of that was scrubbed. I mean, you to go into the, the Mexico Coco area there, you would think that Dia de los Muertos is like the religion of Mexico. And it's not. I might not agree with everything about Catholicism, but objectively... It's Catholicism. And so it was weird to try to immerse myself in this whole, hey, we're in old Mexico. This is great without any acknowledgement of the absolutely dominant faith of the people there. So I was feeling that a little bit. Then we left there and we went over to the stave church in Norway was, I think, the very next one. And I went in and I was like, ah, I don't know. That's disappointing. I don't know. You don't have to agree with somebody's read on stuff to just include the acknowledgement that this is a very formative part of a group's culture. But I don't know. They made the decisions they made. I maybe found that a little bit off-putting. If you were in charge of Epcot Center, like if you became president tomorrow, would you have there be some representation of the religions that underscore all of that architecture and all of that style that people are going to look? Or would you play it safe and try to wash all belief in deity out of the conversation like they do. Dude, that's a hard question, man. You're trying to make a theme park that appeals to everybody in the world. Yeah. And nobody can do that. You nope. you cannot <laughs> you cannot do a thing that's that doesn't offend anyone. I was thinking about it today. Um I was thinking about a tweet you could make that would offend no one. And I actually <laughs> tried this. Okay. Um I tried to tweet something. I said something along the lines of, like, I love you, or... Oh, yeah. Yeah, that was the purest thing. Oh, yeah, I remember that tweet. Yeah, that was the purest thing I could think of. I was like, I'm just going to test tweet, and my goal is to tweet something that offends no one. And I thought for a really, really long time, and I was like, well, the only thing I can think of, the purest thing I could think of is love. How can I tweet something that is unoffendable, or what? what however you would verb that? You know what I'm trying to say. Yep. So I tweeted, I love you, and people got irritated. <laughs> what? And I was Why? Like, you got to tell me what they said. I don't remember. It was just like, oh, yeah, th what is this? Some kind of test about what kind of tweet, like, to, you know, offend somebody? <laughs> you know, like, it it became meta. Mm -hmm. But imagine, imagine trying to make something that doesn't offend, like, anyone at all in the whole world. It's impossible. Of course it is. And so I think... The introduction, like if you were to make anything that acknowledged, like if you were to put a cross up in Mexico in Epcot, mm -hmm. you know, somebody would be upset. Like the In God We Trust on the Money, right? Sure. There are people that hate that. There are people that love that. But sure. it's, it's, a, it's a razor, like it's a dividing line. So if the moment you put anything up at all, people are just going to freak out. It's interesting that the absence of it bothered you. I don't think it's the absence of it. It's, it's that they went up so close to the line and then pretended like it wasn't a part of reality. I think that's what offended you, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and Sleeping Beauty's Castle, same thing. There's a mosaic in there that tells the story. I think it's of Sleeping Beauty. I'm pretty sure that's right. It's a beautiful mosaic. But all of the architecture of medieval Magic Kingdom and the castle... All of that is undergirded by a version of medieval Christianity that ultimately I don't practice and that I disagree with in many ways. But still, 
Like, that's what the moment is, and there's all kinds of redemptive stuff about it. I mean, clearly Disney is tacitly acknowledging that tons of redemptive things came out of that culture that did grow up around those religious assumptions because they built a whole theme park to look like it. I think it was modeled after New Schwanstein, right? The castle in Germany. Yeah, I've heard that. I mean, it, it's in the same zip code, but I mean, now we're into simulacra and simulacrum. I mean, Neuschwanstein, and I never know quite how to say it. It's not a medieval castle. It's a more mid-modern or late modern imitation or homage to fantasy castles of the Middle Ages. Right. So even it is an acknowledgement, even if it's one step removed. Is that making sense what I mean there? Yeah, absolutely, because okay. it's it's a reproduction. Like the uh, if you go inside the castle, the great hall where you eat. Have you ever been to New Schwanstein? No, and I want to badly. I went a long time ago, That's and cool. if you go in the great hall on the inside, um, you can tell like it feels like Disneyland, like it is really? or Disney World. Yeah, it's you can tell that it was made to feel like an era that it didn't. Like one of his favorite, I forget the guy's name that made the castle. But one of his friends at the time, was it Handel? No, it's, oh, shoot, what, there, there's uh, some- Wagner. I, I, Wagner, that's it. Was it was yeah, Richard Wagner. You. Yeah, I, wow. Yes. Yes, I'm, this is coming back to me. Go ahead, though. Yeah, you could tell that there was this play to entertainment or fantasy or make-believe. That, like, in that room, you feel like, oh, like, we got some knight, knights in shining armor kind of thing going on, like suits of armor- I don't think that was a thing when this thing was built, but it, but this stuff is here. Why? And it's because of the throwback, like you're saying. Yeah. So I don't know. I feel like with all culture, it's all born out of something, something beautiful, a bunch of stuff that's relatively neutral, some ugly stuff. That's just what you're going to get. And I guess I don't like the strategy. I would rather go into the Morocco area and be like, well, I'd expect there to be some Islam here. And there is. Huh. I'm not a practitioner of Islam, but a whole lot of people are, and a whole lot of those people are pretty well cultured and smart and cool and seem great, and I bet they'll really enjoy it when they come here. And those of us who are outsiders, eh, it's kind of fun to get a sense of how Islam informed these different aspects of culture. They acknowledged that Arabic culture preserved the ancient Greek texts in the Epcot ride. But even there, they stepped right up to the threshold, but wouldn't acknowledge that it was the tenets of that expression of Islam that prompted the people that made the Arab knowledge revolution happen. They didn't make the connection. They tiptoed right up to it, but didn't give credit. Look, if you want to criticize a religion for the negative stuff that comes out of it, I think that's cool. I, th I think just being honest is cool. I you also got to give credit to the stuff that is good. And that's something, if we don't have that Islamic cultural golden age, that revolution that happened in the Middle Ages, most of the stuff that the Greeks thought of would be lost. I mean, thank you, Islam, for creating a culture and a group of people who wanted to preserve that kind of knowledge and who were curious about the natural world. I just think you got to give credit where it's due. And I, I guess I disagree with the cultural direction of trying to pretend that these things don't exist and aren't a part of who we've been and who we still are. So it didn't make me angry. It didn't make me like, boycott Disney, that's bullcrap. I wanted to see a church in here that looks just like where I go to church, where they say all the things like I say. It's just strategically, I think I maybe respectfully disagree with how they're coming at it. You were right. You can't tweet anything. You can't make an amusement park without offending somebody. So why not appeal to the bigness of people and let the offended people be offended? Hmm. I don't know. Because they're a business? <laughs> Sure. Yeah. And if they think that's the strategy that's most likely to get it done, I get it. But they're also a business that has calculatingly bought up all of our myths. And so I, I kind of care what Disney thinks because myth is truth. I mean, so much of cultural truth comes through in myth. And now one company owns all the myths that we're making right now. And that has implications. So I'm kind of vested. I care about their strategy. What do you mean they've bought all the myths? They're buying up all the entertainment. Yeah, I mean, comic books and Star Wars. I mean, Star Wars was never meant to be this historically, scientifically accurate expression of something that happened a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. It's a space opera. And in the same way that operas are an absurdity, they're an, an oversimplification that gets you to the human element and the cultural element. So Star Wars, it was never meant to be the expanse. 
there's different things. Star Trek doesn't feel like Star Wars because it's not a space opera. It's trying to do something different. Star Wars is a myth in the same way that the Lord of the Rings, the Chronicles of Narnia are a myth in the same way that the, oh, what's the the non-theistic uh, attempt at creating a Chronicles of Narnia-like environment, the Golden Compass. It hasn't got the traction, but it's an attempt at being a modern myth. The Marvel stuff is a modern myth. And whoever controls that myth has a tremendous amount of influence on the future. And, and I guess that's why I'm vested. Did that make more sense? I took a second run at it there. No, why do they control the future? They're just stories. Because they control the story. Because <laughs> the story is how we think. It's how we idealize things. It's why I think a lot of people who make stories have tried to be a little more conscious of representing people in a different light instead of just typecasting this kind of person or that kind of person or this ethnicity in this way or that way. I think folks have rightly tried to imagine heroism of all different stripes and colors and appearances and mindsets and mentalities and approaches to life. And I think to a certain point, that is excellent. But I also don't think that is the grand narrative of everything. There, there's something bigger than just representation. And I'm hoping that we kind of get that to a point of healthy equilibrium where everybody feels like they're a part of this big shared collective story that we have together, that it doesn't nurture an adversarial sense between us, but instead we just, you know, I'm always, always yearning for that, get to a place where we just like each other and we can start making things together again, point. And so if the end game is representation, I think Disney is short-sighted. That can only carry the story so far. Ultimately, there has to be more. And I hope that as we get more comfortable with each other in this great big new shared world where we all communicate, and share the same space, I hope we kind of round about back toward liking the things that make us different and not being threatened by the deeply held historical beliefs that we might not hold in common, but that we all have one way or another culturally. And Disney has their hands on the wheel of that a little bit right now. They've spent a lot of money to try to position themselves to have their hands on the wheel in that way. And I'm, I'm rooting for them because they have a lot of influence. Hmm. I don't think controlling the stories and franchises is as important as you think it is. Maybe it is. I mean, they're going to make a boatload of money, but I, d I don't think that's going to affect how I live my life. Mm, no, I, I think it might. <laughs> I think it might. Heroism is stirring. Good storytelling is stirring. I know you can be moved by stories. Consciously, no, maybe not. But story creates a spirit of the age. It creates a way we think about each other. It creates notions of heroism. Notions of heroism and notions of love are two of the things that really make society go. And story affects that as much as anything, I think. Hmm. What do you think most shapes the way we all think about ourselves and the way we think about right, wrong, society, love, heroism? What do you think most shapes that in the world? Family. Where does family get their ideas from? Uh, standing in line at Disney World. Is that the right answer? <laughs> oh, that I'm, trying was to, I'm trying to play ball well here. Done. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, you could be right. It could be that I'm overstating the value of story and myth. You could definitely be right. And I'm just probing for what do you see as being more formative? I don't know, man. Uh, values and morality. That's It's kind of, for our family, that's it. Um, and th those come from our faith. My mm -hmm. faith, I should say. I don't force my faith on my kids. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, like, ultimately you have to make a decision about why you believe what you believe. And that's a personal decision. And I just don't think Iron Man does that to me. <laughs> See, I, just, I think Iron Man does do that to me. And, you know, maybe we're just wired different, but I think it does. Is there, is there any character? Iron Man makes you. Yeah. No. Yeah. Iron Man affects me. No, I recognize it for what it is. Yeah. No, um, not even a little bit. I like that. Iron Man is always in tension with his own pride and ability. And that the moments where he shines the most are where he maybe doesn't completely have the ability to stamp that out about himself. But even if his motives are conflicted, he still does the right thing by other people. And those are his best moments. And that isn't a new archetype for a hero. Yeah, that, that has some stick factor. I, I think for me, that has some stickiness. Wow. I don't want to be him. But yeah, it's, I mean, it's in the ether. Yeah. Not even a little bit for me, man. For me, all it is is, you know what? Um, I'd like to sit down here with the kids, turn a movie on, and escape to Naboo for 30 minutes while we watch a Clone Wars. 
mm-hmm. or I, I'd like to whatever. It, it's literally an escape. Like I, I, I transport my mind somewhere else and and like think to myself, oh well, this is a different simulation. What what would I do if I was in that situation? Well, it's completely different knowing that stormtroopers can't hit anything and I'm not actually <laughs> going to die. Right. You know. Right. But there's a very strict line for me. I, I don't let those stories enter into how I affect real people in the real world or how I interact with them. Like, not even a little bit. But surely you would rather have your kids emulate the courage and moral clarity of Ahsoka Tano more than, say, Emperor Palpatine. I think it's dangerous if they emulate any of it. I don't want them to model their own behavior after a fictional character written by other people that may or may not have an agenda. I don't even entertain that idea. And that's not where I want to be either. Model my character after. I I hope I didn't say that. What I'm saying is when you see an archetype of a hero, a villain, a conflicted hero, a rogue with a heart of gold who's a scoundrel but still tries to do right, you see any of these archetypes play out, it helps you visualize the end game. It helps you visualize what happens. I mean, it's a morality play. It's like the classic Greek literature. It's like Shakespeare. It's taking something without it actually having to have happened and putting these characters in motion and letting these ethics and these approaches and these styles of life, these relational mindsets, it's letting all of this stuff play out in this little contrived world. And in doing so, you kind of get a little sample of, hmm, well, maybe that's how that would work. Maybe that's how that would work. I think it informs us whether we want it to or not. I'm not proposing that you should just pick a Marvel character and be like, I'm going to model my life after that guy. I think it's, if you think this is a bad thing, I would say I think it's more insidious than that. If you think this is a potentially redemptive thing to engage with stories in this way, I would say I think it's a little more complex than that. But no, I'm definitely not thinking in terms of here's a role model now, do whatever Captain America would do. Does that make sense, the distinction? I think I understand, but for me, the only the only genre that crosses this line or the only fictional universe that gets anywhere close to this is Narnia, and that's because I know what the writer was going for. Like, I know the writer was making an allegory that had direct correlations with Christianity, like yeah. the brokenness of people uh, modeled in Edmund, and the fact that you know, forgiveness, modeling that and some of the other characters and, you know, what it looks like to appeal to honor more than anything or to do what is right, no matter the cost and reap it cheap. I know the basis of these characters because I share the faith of the the one that wrote it, Lewis. Hmm. So when I enter into Disney World, I'm like, okay, cool. Escapism, whatever, doesn't matter. Yeah. Okay. But then when I, when I read... The Chronicles of Narnia, which I I do occasionally, and I think about Edmund taking the Turkish delight from the White Witch and slowly yeah. become a, becoming addicted to a thing that was going to be a fleeting pleasure, but then kind of crept into his life, and it's a thing that he wants to escape, but he can't, and then he kind of loses the will to fight it, yeah. and then eventually a friend enters into his life and tells him, hey, look, you know, this is not right, and this is why this is not right. You have to align to that which is true. And then he comes back around from that. I understand that on a completely different level because of the purpose. It, it was, I mean, Lewis was writing that to model the cyclical nature of sin in our own lives and how we want to do things that are right, but we don't because we're too scared. And sometimes we don't want to do things mm-hmm. that are wrong, but we do because we're interested in the fleeting pleasure of it. And so those things align with truth to me, which is why I like Reaper Cheap so much. Yeah. And have a little stuffed mouse on the shelf behind yeah, me now. As, as well you should. Well, let me ask you this in follow up. That, that makes a ton of sense to me. That's well articulated. Does Disney own the rights to Chronicles of Narnia, the movies? I think they do now, don't they? Uh, I can't keep it straight. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, I think so. I've, I mean, I think it's on Disney Plus. Is it on Disney Plus? So they do own that. So if they try to like change the agenda of that, I mean, that would be a travesty, first of all. It would be a co-opting of the myth to move it from communicating one set of values and truths to communicating a different one. And that, and that would be a pity. I think you probably should leave the myths where they are and let them tell the story they were meant to tell. They'll be better, even the ones you don't like. It'll be better if they just tell what they were meant to tell.
Can I ask you a follow-up question to what you're saying about Narnia? Yeah. I think you said a crap ton of stuff that makes a ton of sense there. And I kind of latched on to you talking about addiction and depravity. Like just the human inability to help ourselves with stuff that is destructive sometimes. And I wonder if you knew the agenda of the author was counter to your own or the background, the thinking, the philosophy, the theology. Like let's say they believe the exact opposite you do about everything, but they write a great story about depravity. I think of the first season of Westworld on HBO. It is a disaster. I mean, the show is well done. I couldn't watch it after one season because it was so transfixed on the endlessness of human depravity, the endlessness of our capacity for evil. So I know the person who made that program, having listened to some of the interviews, I know the person who made it does not share the same outlook on the world or faith or philosophy as I do. But wow, I mean, that show really drives home the point that um, we got problems. I think about addiction and there was that show, I can't even remember the name of it now, but it was the one where Keanu Reeves was addicted to gambling and booze and he couldn't help himself and he had to work with some kids on a, a baseball team as their coach and you're rooting for him the whole time. But like Edmund, he couldn't help himself with the Turkish delight and it damaged his soul and you just want to see him come out of it. And eventually, like Edmund, somebody comes alongside and is like, hey, this is how we pull out of this tailspin. Now, the person who wrote that, I assume, does not share your values. But shows like that, if there are heroes, if there are characters, if there are themes that accidentally mirror things you believe to be profoundly eternally true, do you resonate with those shows? Or does knowing where the author is coming from kind of reduce it to either escapism you enjoy or escapism you'd want to pass on? That's a good point. That's a good point. You've you've backed me off of the ledge there of drawing the hard line. Yeah, I, I think I can see those things and I and I do, but I I always go into it thinking, oh well this is this is a character and Yeah, okay. So so I, I think you've made me reverse course at least a little bit on that. If I see those values which are true in the person, or how do I say this? Yes, a well-written character that has problems of their own and has to figure out how to overcome those with the help of some external power other than themselves, mm -hmm. I can get behind that and, and understand it and think about it. I'm trying to remember a character that was that made me do that, though. Can you think of a... I mean, are you serious about Iron Man? Well, yeah. I mean, Iron Man is drunk on his lust for himself. He's addicted to compliments and fawning and being adored. It caused him to make a robot monster that threatened to destroy all of human existence. And that monster, Ultron, was the embodiment of the hubris of Tony Stark. It's the embodiment of his addiction to pride. And ultimately, it was Tony Stark who found a way to, or helped find a way to slay that beast of his own pride but he couldn't do it without the help of his friends. And, and ultimately, part of what helped destroy that monster of his own pride was a being, a mind that was an expression of himself that took on the form of the vision. I mean, that's what finally put down Ultron, the beast that is the manifestation of Stark's pride. So, yeah, I think Stark is an example of what you're describing there. Yeah. So apparently you just consume movies and entertainment on a completely different level than I do. I view it as a departure from re reality, and it seems that you stitch the two together, story and reality, a lot tighter than I do. Is that true? I would say that what you just said about how I watch it is fair, whether it's meant as a tip of the cap or a critique. Either way, it is what it is. I think It's not meant either way. I I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying it's different. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that's very true. I don't care about stories the way like angry people care about, oh, I didn't want that character to do that in Star Wars. I don't feel that very often. I'm just intrigued at what we're driving at and how we see the world and the moral philosophy that goes on behind all these decisions for how you write a character and what you do in the world. That's, that's why I like Game of Thrones. I mean, that was a very chaotic world that you sent characters out into, and they didn't have much hope of doing good in a world like that. And I enjoyed watching them all muddle through it and try as they may to either give in to the brokenness of it all or to keep battling against all hope to try to find some redemptive way to move forward in that mess. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like that element of storytelling and story watching and 
you and I talk about a lot of things together, but stories doesn't fuel much of our conversation. And maybe it's just because we go to them looking for different things. I think so. And that's okay. Yeah, I'm at peace with that too. Yeah, and Disney World, full circle here, it's all those stories mushed into a really, I think, pretty neat, pretty well-conceived acreage where you go and you swim in these shared stories that maybe like you and me, you're coming at differently than the person who's next to you on the ride. But these are our shared stories, like it or not. These are our modern myths. And we get together and we ride on them and we walk through their halls and we think about what they mean and we take them for whatever we want to take them for. And yeah, it's kind of a, it's a fun day of immersing ourselves in the shared story. And I, I really did, uh, with the exception of the lines, I really did enjoy it. That's why it means so much more to you. Whereas to me, I'm like, yay, hey, Disney World, whatever, yay, oh, cool, Buzz Lightyear. You're like experiencing it on a very different level. You're like, oh, well, this is about the battle of evil and good and how I fit into it and... Am I reading this correctly? And I'm not. I'm not doing any weird voices to try to no, uh, no, no. characterize no it. Caricature it. <laughs> you know what I'm trying to say. You and um, I have been really good friends for a very long time now, and I think we do a good job of getting after each other. And like, I think we have really fair ground rules for jabbing each other and you know debating things and harmless bickering here and like. You're a very dear friend, and I feel like right now. Given the last hour of conversation, I feel like I understand you better than I ever have because I better understand how you think of story and heroism and how that all affects the world or your life or your heart or lack thereof, how it doesn't affect your life or your world or your heart. I feel like I understand that better than I ever have. And I am so grateful for you going down this rabbit hole with me and thinking about stories in this way. Hmm. You definitely see it on a deeper level than I do. I feel more like a robot with you than I ever have. <laughs> uh, and you, <laughs> it, it does not compute. <laughs> you know, I feel I feel more like, uh, yeah. That's interesting. It's very interesting. So, so what are you seeing? What are you seeing in me that I don't understand clearly? Oh, I, I, no, you've said it. You've articulated it really well. That entertainment is about escapism, and either it entertains you and resonates with what you believe to be true, or it just doesn't, and or or it doesn't entertain you, or it doesn't resonate with what you believe to be true, and then yeah, yeah, shrug. I'm guessing you can kind of watch a show out of one eye, other eye on the on the phone or a book or something else. I can't do that quite as well, but I mean, I don't know. Maybe you're engrossed in shows too, but um. For me, story in any given era is where all of the stuff that I'm into plays itself out. The history of ideas. I don't know it all. I'm not even close to knowing it all. I'll never know it all. But I love this world. This is what I put all my energy into is understanding all the things that all the people have thought collectively that add up to whatever it is that we think now. Where's the playground where that all works itself out? Well, you got uh, academics. I've been plugged in there for good chunks of my life. You got politics, which right now that conversation's not very fun. It's not very idea driven. It's kind of just more eh, get after people and be mean and don't really talk about positions or ideas or workshop stuff. So I don't really like hanging out in that world very much right now. But stories for all of time, stories is where you take all of those assumptions that you don't even know that we have, that we share or that we might even feel tension or conflict over, conflict with others, conflict with the physical world, conflict with ourselves. And if you do story well, you play that stuff out in a way that resonates. That makes you think, oh, dang. Yeah, that is me. Or, oh, dang, I hope that's never me. Or, oh, dang, that's my friend. That's my relative. And I understand them better now. I get that. It's like how the person who just goes on the internet and yells about things they disagree with, it's not very effective. The person who cracks jokes and uses a little bit of satire and makes everybody laugh while maybe making a point, that goes down a lot easier. It tends to get through the armor a little more. And for me, the story is that it's the playground where all of these swirling masses of ideas, sacred, secular, technological, medicinal, philosophical, moral, they all come together in this one package and you just never know what you're going to find in there. Who knows what influenced this author and what little gems 
are going to be there? What little connections are going to happen? And so I, I just love unwrapping the present of a great new story and thinking about what it all what it all means. Where you and I, I think, are very different. I think you feel that when you look at the tension strength of a fly rod. I think you feel that when you look at a simple engine on a 1949 Ford 9N. You're like, oh, look at this. It only has like 15 moving parts and a whole tractor. How'd they do that? And you see that and you find it enchanting and filled with meaning. I see that and I see some meaning to it, but I just don't know enough. I don't swim in the waters enough to see what you see when you pop open that hood or when you inspect that device or the engineering behind it. But you see beauty. You see order. Here's a word you use a lot when you talk about those things that I don't think to use when I look at mechanical things. You see truth. And so that poetry and that artistry of being able to look at a device that some other mind, some other hands have crafted, you can look at that and you see it and you feel empathy toward the person who made it. You can see inside their world, inside their mind a little bit and be like, I get why you made this decision and not this decision. That's elegant. You use that word a lot. I think we're very much alike. It's just that we swim in in different waters of intellectual pursuit. And so we see that beauty and that order and that truth in different places. And while we might appreciate the other, we see the depth and the riches in the place that more corresponds to what we're into. And I feel like I understand that better about you given this conversation. And I like that. Have you thought about writing a story that does all the things you want a story to do? I have. Stories are hard. Um, I've written a lot of stories and I have a couple that are done and that I think are, are really effective and I don't know what to do with them. What about the one where the, the guy lives in his parents' basement and he's hunting Sasquatch? <laughs> I think it's the best What's thing I've name? ever written. I'm not joking. What's... His name is Freddie Beckman and the show is called Freddie <laughs> Beckman Truth Hunter. And I think it's the best <laughs> thing I've ever written. It's a story about an adult Sasquatch hunter who has agoraphobia and doesn't want to go outside, but also he'd really like to find a Bigfoot. His weaknesses are that he's not discerning. He just is gullible and he kind of trusts everybody, but he's in a field where gullibility isn't going to work. You need credibility and you need shrewdness and incredulity. And so he tries to develop that, but it's clumsy and he follows the wrong people and idolizes the wrong people, but he's kind and he's good which also gets him into trouble. What's his friend's name? His friend's name is... I'd still like to make this movie. I think this screenplay is a ton of fun. But yeah, I did exactly what you're describing. I wrote a novel that was the same goal. I've got a children's book that is finished. I mean, all the plot and the characters and what happens to them all. I just haven't put all the flesh on it yet. Why don't you publish it? I got it, man. I just figured all of it out. Okay. Everything. Figured all of it out. All right. Publish that story... Make it be part of the collective myth, as you like to call it. Yeah. And then eventually it'd get bought out by Disney and mm-hmm. we could go ride the ride. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, how great would that be to go ride the ride of the book that we decided needed to be published while we were sitting here? On the, I, w- I would love that. Why don't you do it, man? Publish the book. You'd have to make it animated for Disney to pick it up, though, wouldn't you? Ah, it's good source material. They could do something else with it. It's a good story. It's a really good story. I wrote it for my kids. My kids are the characters in it. And all of my kids, the weakness of the characters is stuff that was actually tough for them as little kids. The moments where they overcome it are all subtle nods to things that happened in real life as they figured some stuff out on it. Why don't you share the story? If writing the story was the the point for you, well, maybe that's it. Maybe just writing it was important for you and you don't care to share it. Yeah. What's going on there? That's a really good question. Um, I don't know. Right at the height of the time where I was writing and producing tons of stuff and putting it in front of no one, I got to a place where I was kind of discouraged and was like, you know what? I would like for someone to hear the things I write. And so I started a YouTube channel and a couple of podcasts. And that's kind of choked out a lot of the writing. I mean, I write, but I write for a YouTube channel and a couple of podcasts and not really for beauty and making the story and taking all the elements of all the things that are beautiful and putting them together anymore. So it sounds like that's Hmm. uh, my own problem. Throw it out there, man. Throw your hat in the ring. Why not? Yeah, I appreciate that thought. Why not? All right. I I will tell you this. So that there is action in keeping with what you've suggested, I will put fingers to keys on that children's story again before I fall asleep tonight. 
I will at least advance the cause today, not tomorrow. Today, I will advance that cause. Do it and then figure out how you're going to distribute it, okay. even if it's just to a few people. Okay. I like that. I wish I had some corresponding thing like that to bounce back at you, but I feel like you're telling the stories you want to tell right now. Oh, I'm doing something different that I want to do. I am starting to game out how to make things. I want manufacturing to happen in America. We are losing the ability to think through a problem, figure out the solution, and manufacture that solution. Mm -hmm. And so I've recently visited a couple of manufacturing facilities, and I'm designing things to be made specifically for the purpose of manufacturing things in America. So that's what I'm working on. And I don't know that I'm going to succeed in what I want to do, but that's my current 50 meter target. These goals are both so in keeping with where we're at. So write the book, man. Yeah. When can we talk about that? Like, Can we talk about that with microphones on sometime? Yeah. Let, let me get closer to manufacturing the actual item. But yeah, absolutely. Okay. I'm actually sourcing facilities to make certain components of it now. Okay. And I don't know if you realize how hard it is to make things in America, but there is a tremendous amount of infrastructure that has just gone overseas, specifically to China. No, I There's did also not, a tremendous amount. Know that. Yeah. It's just gone, man. Gone. That's a topic for another day. But to close out this episode, I am grateful to understand how you interact with stories. It does help me understand you a lot better. It's more than escapism for you. It has deep, visceral meaning. Like it crosses some kind of boundary for you into reality that it doesn't for me. And that's interesting. I think it's really cool. And I would like to see the stories that you write actually become reality someday so I can ride the ride. Okay. Yeah, absolutely, man. Good deal. All right. Tapping out. I'll catch you soon, my friend. All right, man. Have a good one. 